Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, when even the head of Zoom is experiencing Zoom fatigue, uh, we have to really ask if this format is uh, approaching its limits, but uh, we have to be resilient. That's the theme of uh, today's discussion. And uh, we're delighted to be here for another uh, OECD New Approaches to Economic Challenges, uh, Rebuilding Macro and Fields Institute discussion. We've had a lot of collaboration recently on the theme of systemic recovery. And uh, we've been thinking about the recovery in terms of balancing a, a whole set of different factors, uh, markets, states, and civil societies, how they can reinforce each other, efficiency and resilience, how to combine them. Some systems probably work very well when they're efficient. Others like uh, keystone capacities, markets for sensitive products, we probably want those to be a bit more resilient. Growth and sustainability, national and global stability, because in a complex system, small shocks can have big effects. Short-term emergency measures that we're taking right now and long-term structural change, and how can we balance those? And from the discussions, it's been very clear that to achieve a systemic recovery, we really need to think beyond our silos, comprehend our interconnections and build resilience into our systems. And this raises some fundamental questions about how our societies, our economies, our markets function, how they're organized. It makes us think about individuals, their interaction, the emergent properties that these interactions produce, how the systems evolve and change, and how they can fail. And we've been thinking a lot too about how to think about these weaknesses and vulnerabilities, how we can model them, develop analysis, concepts, and tools to help our policymakers enhance systemic resilience. And as I said, this really starts with individuals and psychological resilience. And individuals are really the key to absorbing and adapting to a whole range of social and economic shocks. And brain health disorders already account for about $3 trillion of lost productivity every year. And the pandemic has really made things worse in this regard, that due to social and physical distancing, unemployment and underemployment, stress and other factors, there's been a significant increase in issues such as depression, anxiety, social isolation, substance abuse, loneliness, and cognitive decline, particularly in older adults. And this really affects the way we respond and react to various different shocks. And whereas the human body is resilient in its ability to persevere through infections or trauma, even through severe diseases, critical life functions are sustained and the body recovers, often adapting by developing immunity to further attacks of the same type. But our society's critical infrastructure, cyber, energy, water, transportation, communication, even things like democracy, lacks the same degree of resilience, typically losing essential functionality following adverse events. So we need resilience. And a question that many policymakers have, is there anything really new here? Uh, we've always had discussions about regulations and protections, about fiscal buffers, which give us the space to adapt to whatever crisis emerges to structural reforms, making markets more flexible. Uh, will that help us absorb a shock so that you can have this endogenous reorganization of resources? And how we think about our systems, uh, the whole set of human systems and how they're designed. Uh, markets may self-organize in response to shocks and to absorb them. The interventions that we need to take place, stockpiles uh, of essential equipment, bailouts to maintain critical capacities and safeguard the economies. But we're really moving into the realm of something that I think is different, which is systemic resilience. And why do we need systemic resilience? Because the systems in which we all depend are subject to crises and cascading failures, which can emerge from a variety of sources, including financial crises, natural disasters, geopolitical tension, cyber attacks, pandemics, et cetera. And these risks are amplified by several overarching trends, the intensification of inequality, the hyper-complexity of finance, the rise of digitalization, concentration and monopolization, and environmental emergencies such as climate change and biodiversity loss. So these types of shocks, they're not only raising the frequency and intensity of these uh, shocks, but enabling their impact to cascade from system to system. So it's no longer about just hardening a particular subsystem, but thinking about how the whole system is organized and how we can manage that. And COVID-19 has really exposed that because it's really a multi-system challenge where the, the threats, ex exploited vulnerabilities and consequences continue to manifest around the globe. 
and uh, consideration needs to be given, not just to how the risk is absorbed and mitigated, but how affected systems will recover, adapt, and preferably bounce forward towards a more ideal system state. And we hear a lot about getting back to normal or even to bouncing forward to a new normal. But uh, what the resilience literature has told us for some time is that new normals are essentially normal. They're, the system is constantly reorganizing and reconfiguring. And uh, thinking through these dimensions of resilience in infrastructure, in information, cognitive and social domains really opens the door to a new type of economics. And rebuilding macro is really spearheaded that moment and what they call social macroeconomics. Final point is that even though we know that there are these systemic properties that uh, our economies, our financial systems have, we don't need to wait for a crisis to know that a system is dysfunctional or not delivering positive outcomes for citizens. And yet often action to take a more resilient approach is hampered by an institutional myopia, both in the private sector and in governments, that essentially they're playing, playing for time and kicking the can down the road and hope that a, a serious shock will occur on someone else's watch. But if we're serious about resilience and resilience of systems, we really need to have a fundamental examination of our policies and the economics that underpin it. And perhaps this needs to be situated within a, a new narrative of progress. Uh, to kick off our discussion, we're delighted to welcome Lord Sidwell, who's the chairman of the G7 panel on global economic resilience. He's a former cabinet secretary and national security advisor in the UK and was permanent secretary at the Home Office from 2013 to 2017. And before that, he had a long career at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, serving in places like Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Cyprus, and Pakistan. So he's got a, a wonderful background to really help us think about what is systemic resilience and what can we do to enhance it. So please, Lord Sema. Uh, thank you very much. Very good to be with you. Thank you, William. Um, and uh, very good to be with you this afternoon. Um, and uh, crikey, you've set the scene very uh, broadly there. and, and um, I think uh, I'm only relieved that my panel has been asked to look at global economic resilience, and uh, we haven't had to start with the psychological individual resilience you were talking about and, uh, and branch out. I think given the time we had, that would have been extremely, uh, uh, extremely challenging for us. Uh, but you're absolutely right to make those connections um, from the individual to the global, uh, between different uh, definitions of resilience, uh, economic, societal, um, individual, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, it, it is clear that this is um, uh, becoming a bigger feature, not just of the economic debate, uh, and as you said, the, the um, potential to essentially develop a new, more sophisticated economics um, based on um, uh, some assumptions that go, that, that are uh, more soundly based, scientifically based than economic man, um, as I seem to remember it being taught uh, to us. Um, uh, I, note, I note the somewhat ironic uh, smiles on the face of economist women uh, on this call, um, but uh, uh, to actually think in, a, uh, think in a more sophisticated way about the impact on individual citizens and so on. It's actually a lot of that has come out in the discussions that me and my panel uh, have, been, uh, have been having. Um, uh, so just briefly to, to give you a sense of what we're, what we're looking at, and uh, the first thing I should say is that that um, our work has been, the platform for our work um, was a report we commissioned uh, from the OECD uh, that uh, looked at the, the, uh, the, the um, issues uh, and indeed uh, made some uh, recommendations about policy areas we should explore. Essentially, we've taken a broad view of what constitutes um, economic resilience. There is some difference within the academic, academic debate on this, but if you look at it from the perspective of the citizen or a politician representing the citizen, what they think of about resilience is really about the ability of economies to have sustained, sustainable, inclusive growth, um, to withstand, absorb, and recover from shocks, um, uh, and to uh, and that economic uh, resilience is contributing to wider uh, societal uh, uh, resilience. Um, and economic resilience, we do need to think of uh, across um, uh, in a broad sense as well. So, of course, it incorporates the financial system. Needs to think we need to be thinking. We need to think about the new digital and cyber-based uh, economy as much as we do the traditional service and uh, 
goods, agri-foods, etc., economies of the past. One of the um, interesting features, I think, that COVID has revealed, and the, the, of course the point about COVID is that it was a health shock um, uh, and it was the policy response to that health crisis um, that um, actually imposed the economic shock, the lockdowns uh, and so on, largely, rather than the health, the health crisis um, itself. And so the interaction between a health crisis, uh, political decision making, economic consequences, and of course, probably in the long term, the feedback loop from those economic consequences to um, mental and physical health uh, of our citizens. Uh, and as you will all know, there are significant, uh, the significant evidence that the lockdowns have had uh, a, significant, uh, a, a, severe, a severe impact, um, uh, if not as acute as the COVID, the COVID shock itself. Um, it's, it's in uh, that um, uh, circle of, um, uh, of causality, really, um, that the economic shock uh, uh, itself uh, arose. And economies like the UK's that are three quarters um, uh, services on the supply side, three quarters consumption on the demand side, and three quarters of the assets are intangible, were um, uh, particularly vulnerable. That economic structure was particularly vulnerable to the lockdown. Um, to, to the impact of the lockdown, of course, uh, anaesthetized by uh, very significant uh, fiscal interventions. What we don't yet know, and will be interesting to see, is whether economies structured that way will also recover faster uh, than others. So, so is the V deeper, but is it sharper um, because of that structure compared to economies where those, uh, the proportions that, um, between services, consumption, and intangibles, et cetera, are different? Um, the, the big underlying policy question really is whether um, the benefits of openness um, of an integrated global economic system and um, of uh, uh, which, which has uh, been extended to include emerging economies to their benefit, and that one can argue has been responsible for the greatest increase in uh, prosperity, at least on average, and the greatest reduction in poverty, um, in human history, although with very differential of, uh, uh, effects, of course, particularly on disadvantaged groups within our own societies. But whether um, that era of globalization can continue and the um, gaps in global economic governance, which clearly hasn't kept pace with economic developments, particularly in the new economy, um, uh, governance over the technological, technological sectors is clearly weaker than it is over some of the traditional sectors. Whether we can um, adjust, reinforce, reform, update that model, or whether um, the, the um, uh, uh, impetus toward essentially a more protectionist approach in many countries um, is uh, likely to continue. And certainly my own view is that uh, in the absence of a positive intervention from um, world leaders, starting with the G7, but then hopefully um, um, expanding out from there to incorporate the G20, the OECD, uh, et cetera, um, then a drift into protectionism under a whole range of different labels, probably none of them called that, um, is uh, otherwise inevitable. Uh, and the risk is that that um, uh, uh, step by step um, uh, um, uh, uh, disrupts the benefits we've seen from uh, global, global value chains and the integration of the global economy, including to developing and emerging economies that have benefited, as I say, from access to it. In terms of risks, um, we're thinking about uh, environmental, um, economic and geopolitical risks. The economic risks, of course, are rising essentially within the economic system, endogenous, the others um, largely exogenous. Environmental risks, we would include uh, zoonotic diseases, but also antimicrobial um, resistance, loss of biodiversity, and of course, the biggest of all climate change. And you see those things, uh, of course, intersecting in ways that could cause a, a very severe future uh, economic shocks. Uh, and then lay those over some of the other changes, um, a, a demographic change, for example, um, the debt overhang, which means there's less fiscal firepower available to deal with the next crisis than was available to deal with this one. Um, uh, etc. And the fact that we're putting our economies through a huge transition over the next uh, 25 to 30 years in order to meet net zero and uh, our other environmental uh, objectives. And our view is that um, uh, the, the likelihood of um, shocks 
um, either exogenous or endogenous to the uh, economic system, having the amplified effect that we've seen from COVID um, is probably higher than it has been at least in our, in our lifetimes. Um, we are looking at global, govern global economic governance, we're looking at global supply chains, and we are also looking at the new economy um, and asking ourselves um, whether our current uh, systems, public-private partnerships, et cetera, are uh, designed right for those uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, it is clear that this does need to be um, government uh, uh, as well as private. We need to identify where there are either uh, arising bottlenecks and market failures uh, and address those, but also make sure that we are designing um, global markets uh, in order to ensure that value is created, not extracted. Um, and uh, particularly as economies go through the, uh, the green transition. And one of the conclusions the panel uh, um, has reached is that inclusive growth, particularly ensuring that growth, uh, the benefits of prosperity extend to the most disadvantaged groups, is in itself a matter of economic resilience. That, that economies that invest in skills, in enabling their, their industries and people to transition from sunset to sunrise industries, um, that uh, all of their policies that, that improve productivity, competitiveness and so on actually properly pursued in a genuinely inclusive way will also enhance their collective as well as uh, individual uh, economic, uh, economic resilience. The big question, we, of course, we have to ask ourselves is what is the role for the G7? Much of this is that much of these policy interventions are at the national level. Many of them are for business themselves. Some of them are at um, other uh, for other sovereign entities such as the such as the European the the EU um, uh, or the federal government in the uh, in the United States what is the role for the G7 and we think there are five areas the G7 uh, can address first uh, solidarity so the G7 needs to have a century code of conduct um, uh, about how those countries and entities operate as a group including toward each other because much of the drift towards protectionism of course has been within the G7 as much as um, uh, uh, to deal with um, perceived uh, challenges arising from out with the G7. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, good risk management mechanisms that we can uh, identify, monitor, uh, and then uh, react to emerging risks, whether those are environmental, economic, geopolitical, uh, or whatever. Uh, uh, we need to have the right, uh, we need to intervene to ensure that the regulatory mechanisms at the global level and governance at the global level um, are, are appropriate for the new economy, not just for the uh, sort of 20, 20th century economy. Um, uh, we need to ensure that global value and global supply chains, most of which actually have functioned extremely well through the pandemic, but where they haven't, uh, the right measures are in place and we can learn from the financial crisis and even, even indeed from the OPEC crises of the 70s um, to deal with that. And then we also need to address questions of, uh, uh, of economic uh, inclusion. Um, and that's essentially the approach we're taking. Final point is, um, there, is a, there is of course a big question about whether the G7 itself is a legitimate group of people to be addressing or countries to be addressing this. I think the answer to that, to use the old favorite economist phrase is it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, that, um, uh, uh, that if you think of the G7 as essentially being really economically two plus three, which I know doesn't make seven, but it's essentially uh, the US and the EU, the two continental economies, Western continental economies, if you like, and the three biggest independent advanced economies, Japan, the UK and Canada, with others, of course, associated with it, Australia, um, Republic of Korea and so on. But if, you, if we think of the G7 itself as essentially economically two plus three, then getting agreement between the US and the EU and then the next largest independent advanced economies is undoubtedly necessary if we're to then build a wider consensus um, with other advanced economies, emerging economies, developing economies, and so on, including those with authoritarian political uh, systems. And so we see the G7 as a first step to trying to have a broader consensus, and the proposals we'll make to G7 leaders um, are very much focused not just on what's good for the G7, but what's good for the wider global economic system. William, that's probably enough. I hope that's helpful, uh, a helpful framing of at least the work we're doing on this. That's great, uh, Lord Sewell. Well, thank you so much for outlining some of the thinking of the, the panel on global economic resilience, uh, not this broader uh, systemic uh, view of resilience, but uh, it 
sounds like a great agenda and I, I take away many points uh, that you've raised about the need to reform, update and improve uh, a lot of the systems in which we operate, the endogenous risks that you're thinking a lot about, uh, debt overhangs, transition. Uh, I did think that your blue sky back backdrop was really appropriate with perhaps some clouds on the uh, horizon. Um, but um, thanks so much for uh, outlining some of the thinking there. And uh, we've got a great panel that I think are going to interact with some of the points that you've raised and perhaps raise other issues. We're going to start with uh, Erica Thompson, who's a senior policy fellow in ethics of modeling and simulation at the London School of Economics Data Science Institute. And she's um, really thinking about the dynamics of systems and how we could model them and how to use uh, mathematical modeling to support real world decisions from uh, mathematical and statistical questions about methodologies of inference to psychosocial questions about the formation of confidence and the role of expert judgment, uh, all of which are hugely important in thinking about resilience. So Erica, please. Thank you, uh, pleasure to be here and thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I thought I would talk a bit about mathematical modeling then. Um, as you said, that's what I work on, how we use mathematical models to inform real world decisions. Um, so I'm gonna just focus quickly on three examples and maybe try to pick out some brief lessons for resilience that we can then take into the wider discussion. So the first example I want to talk about is uh, humanitarian decision making. I've been working with a group of humanitarian agencies recently, and I think what we've seen in the humanitarian world over the last five to 10 years is actually quite a big shift um, from the concept of sort of responding to crises after they happen to taking a more anticipatory view and trying to say, well, you know, maybe we've got a forecast of a hurricane bearing down on this island. What can we do in advance to reduce the damage suffered rather than just cleaning up afterwards? Now, obviously, when you start to do that, you know, you're, you're in quite a different regime. You don't know what's happened. You don't know what's going to happen. And you're going to have a trade off because your models are not perfect. Your forecast of the future is not perfect. So you have uh, a trade off between the, the advance warning that you can get of this event happening uh, and the accuracy of your prediction. So you might say, if we have a one day notice, that's no good because we don't have enough time to actually get out there and do the kinds of things that will reduce the impact. But if we're trying to get five or 10 days notice, then that may just be so far in advance that the, the spaghetti plot of uh, ways that that hurricane might go is just too uncertain. It might veer off at the last minute. It might not hit the island at all. So we, we have firstly a kind of financial disincentive to do that because we don't want to waste resources and a reputational disincentive because we don't want to be perceived to be acting in vain. Um, but really, I mean, the mathematical side is, is fairly well defined. We can, if we had enough data, then in principle, we could say how good the model is at each lead time. Um, and we could say, what is the chance of this occurring? Uh, and if we knew what the cost and benefit of each outcome was, then we could assign those values and decide what the optimum course of outcome is optimum course of action is. Um, but of course, I guess you've guessed I'm going to say that that's actually much more difficult than it sounds because, uh, you know, we, in order to make any decision, it is never just about the science. It is never just about uh, what action, what outcome will result from action A or action B or action C. It's also about the relative uh, merit of the outcome, outcome A, outcome B and outcome C. Um, and that depends on your context, that depends on how you assign those values. So for instance, uh, you know, even if you were fully insured, a hurricane strike that uh, knocked your house down would be an extremely traumatic event. Whereas if you're the insurance provider or you're some sort of financial institution, then you could count that as a fully mitigated impact. And another challenge in this context is uh, the, the sort of the way that the funding is quite siloed. We see uh, different pots of funding for crisis response versus crisis anticipation. So, you know, once you tip over time T equals zero, you, uh, you have to access different pots of money. And that becomes really a, an immense structural barrier to doing this. And then, of course, there's seasonal preparedness. Uh, we expect hurricanes to happen in each season. There's general development funding. We should be making these houses better anyway. Uh, and there's climate adaptation. And all of these are sort of accessing different pots of funding and coming at this, what's essentially the same problem with quite different um, 
perspectives, different institutions and different structures. So I suppose there's a concrete recommendation there to move to a more seamless approach and to put the affected communities more at the heart of that kind of decision making. And that ties in with something I'll just mention in passing, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which I think makes some really crucial points about resilience that we can learn from in other contexts. So my second example then is one that everybody will be familiar with, of course, the pandemic. Um, and I think we've seen over the last 18 months, both the immense value of mathematical modeling and also it's really highlighted many of the limitations that mathematical modeling has in informing policy. Um, so, for example, the modeling for monitoring and detection of concerns has been at the forefront from, you know, right the way from day zero uh, to current efforts to track variants as they emerge and as they travel through different countries. Um, but modeling to support policies by making quantitative predictions about what's going to happen next have been, in general, I'd say, less successful. And here we really see the impacts of complexity. You know, if you compare the, the types of decisions that are taking and, and, and the outcomes in different countries, I think that really emphasizes the importance of political and social context, even where those countries um, and their sort of political system, decision making system are informed by essentially the same models. And uh, I think one thing that we've seen that's been really positive has been the very open sharing of data. Um, open research, uh, journals making things open access. I think that's uh, extremely positive and it's something that we, you know, would, would be nice to see in other contexts as well. But I suppose the point there is that the, the data don't speak to speak for themselves. They only speak through uh, someone who exists in a social and political context and someone who has decided what it is that they want to measure, what it is that they want to research, what questions they're trying to answer what graph to show to you to present to the audience um, and how they're going to frame it, you know, how they're going to talk about it. So we, you know, in, in the um, COVID situation, as you've already said, we we're balancing these really incommensurable impacts of loss of life, mental health, the potential for long term health impacts, the economic damage, loss of jobs and livelihoods, intergenerational intergenerational relationships. I mean, all of these things and all of the other knock-on outcomes of COVID that we'll be dealing with for many years to come. Now, no model includes all of these. No model could include all of these. So the question of where it is that we get our information from and what kinds of things we choose to prioritize, I suppose, in the kinds of analyses that we do and the kind of uh, data that we take to be important in informing these decisions, uh, I think is a really interesting question and something that we've seen you know, we've we've really seen that come to the front during the pandemic of different groups of experts kind of vying for uh, political power in different ways. So a third example, um, climate change, climate modeling, uh, something that I've been quite involved with. Now we can model the outcome of global mean temperature very well. And of course, that's the subject of uh, our global targets, two degrees of global mean temperature rise, or perhaps 1.5. But of course, nobody was ever killed by global mean temperature. So in some sense, it's a completely meaningless and useless variable. It's only a summary of the other things that we know. People don't uh, people lose their lives and livelihoods through not through global mean temperature, but through extreme events like hurricanes, droughts, floods, or the economic impacts of a changing changing weather patterns in a in a local area. But those are the variables for which we have most uncertainty. Um, the models don't even always agree with each other, even in quite broad terms. Um, so in deciding what to do, you know, we we can't wait for science to have all the answers. We can't just throw more money at climate prediction centers or pin our hope on technologies that haven't been developed yet. We need to start identifying robust strategies now. And again, picking out the same point, the data don't speak for themselves. We're balancing sort of incommensurable unknowns. And I think maybe one of the things that the, that the climate debate sort of shows us is that we need to be careful in separating these different aspects of confidence and uncertainty. Um, even, even if models are uncertain in important respects that doesn't undermine necessarily our confidence in the in the large scale picture we can say for instance that we have very high confidence uh, i mean it's 
essentially certain that the climate has changed and that that is due to uh, human activity, due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, and that, but that result is not dependent on the model. Whereas if we're starting to say, well, how should we adapt locally, say in London or Paris or Islamabad, you know, we want to be able to decide how to cope with increasing heat stress in a certain area, what kind of policies should we enact? Um, then those are actually dependent on uh, much more local and uh, specific things, which maybe the models disagree on. And we would have to uh, think more carefully about how we incorporate that kind of information. So I suppose the key messages that I'm stressing here with, across these three examples are about sort of prediction, optimization or the lack of optimization and the social context of science. Um, if all our models are wrong, what kind of strategies make sense for long-term model-informed decision-making to be able to say with confidence, yes, all models are wrong, and yet I still can gain useful information from them that I can use to inform my decision-making without the model needing to be perfect. So I think what we see in these fields is a, is a, is a sort of long-term scientific process of maybe coming to terms with the idea that we can't just think our way out of uncertainty, acknowledging those deep or radical uncertainties that, that you were talking about earlier, um, and embracing that uncertainty and learning how to work with it rather than fighting against it. So thinking about the ways that experts like scientists or economists contribute to decision-making, that means acknowledging that our models can only ever be a limited picture and that they're contingent on our own biases and prejudices. So not trying to overstate um, the, the significance of what we get from them, but also not underplaying uh, the importance of the, um, the kind of large scale messages. Uh, there's complexity. So, um, you know, we, we're familiar with the, the butterfly effect and something that I've also talked about in the past is the hawk moth effect. And these are both uh, sort of the idea that small changes can result in very different outcomes. So although that undermines the aspiration to predict in detail, I think there's a positive message too, that it offers the possibility of finding points of leverage, you know, ways that we can change the system for the better in potentially quite radical ways over a short period of time for the better as well as for the worse. And I think that raises questions about the, the role of experts in, in determining or influencing policies and actions. So if expertise is at least partly about social context, what kind of expert do we need for these times? I think that you know, things are different now in the 21st century from how they were in the 20th century. The, the, the role of the expert has changed. So what kind of expert do we need? who will prioritize resilience and working with uncertainty rather than pretending we have all the answers? How do we ensure that expertise appropriately acknowledges potential biases, like the choice to talk about the things we can model most easily rather than the things that matter most to a certain group of stakeholders? And if those value judgments are as important to our decision-making as the scientific information, do we have a sufficiently inclusive and well-structured debate about value judgments? So politics at the moment doesn't really feel very inclusive and well-structured. Um, and maybe there's a passing remark to make there on social media as well, but, but could we do better or how could we do better? And maybe one positive point that comes out of modeling that's of relevance to this discussion is, is sort of the ability to make an answer work. You know, models like real life, they're, they're very flexible. If you have a model and you want to achieve a certain outcome, you can generally tweak the conditions and tweak the parameters to make it happen. So uh, kind of for me, I think that's something major for resilience. I think that's an upside of the great uncertainty that we face at the moment, maybe for the G7 to consider that if we have a strong shared vision for how we want the end of the 21st century to look, taking account of you know, the known strong constraints about what kind of things are possible, then there's a very good chance we can get there. I think I'll leave it at that, thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Erica. And uh, I think since COVID, we're no longer tired of experts, uh, but it's really great to uh, hear about some of the difficulties in using models and data and how we actually make decisions and how to deal with uncertainty and unknowns. So thanks very much for your insights on that. Our next speaker is uh, Annika, and uh, Annika Schmieder, who's the Re Research Director at Reform for Resilience.
the Post-Pandemic Policy Commission, and she has uh, had various different roles in using, again, big data and uh, different uh, ways of thinking about uh, different systems and applying those now in her current work uh, on resilience. So uh, please, Annika. Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me, William and friends. Um, I think I'm going to build a lot on what we've heard from Erica and Lord Sedwell um, just then. Um, so my name is Annika Schmeider. I'm the Research Director at the Reform for Resilience Commission, also proud Associate Fellow at Chatham House, um, and sit in a very unique position as regards the pandemic, having once upon a time been a Treasury advisor and a trained economist, moved more to health and, and during the Ebola outbreak uh, was working inside of WHO. So at the pandemic juncture, when it, when, when it was all first breaking on us in 2020, I, I was really looking at, I guess, a range of perspectives. And I think the challenge that we have is about how we start to take some of these forward. So I'll just share my screen because we're due to um, release our report ahead of G7, actually. You might be interested, Lord Sedwell. Um, and I wanted to share with you just some of our thinking. We've really begun at the point um, of looking at what the experience of the pandemic can actually tell us. Uh, this is very close to the work that I did in Africa um, with the Ebola outbreak, really looking at well, what is it saying about policy, why, about what we understand, and where's that leading edge that we need to take us forward. So for those of you who don't know about the Reform for Resilience um, Commission, it's chaired by Jose Manuel Barroso, who was the former president of the European Commission, um, Malcolm Turnbull, who's the ex-Australian Prime Minister, you can probably guess my voice accent then, um, and also Michelle Williams, who's the head of Dean of Public Health at Harvard University, um, and was started by George Freeman, MP from the UK, um, and has had developed a, a range of networks and research hubs around the world, um, particularly Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, um, and beyond to look at the question of what future resilience should look like based on what we understand from the pandemic. So with our report due in two weeks time, Williams offered me the chance to explain myself and um, relieve my stress for the afternoon. Thank you, William. Um, most definitions of resilience we know focus on the impact of the shock and also the return to normal or whatever we consider normal. Um, but the, what the, the Commission is receiving in terms of messages from our submissions is about the necessary changes that we need to look at in terms of resilience, that systematic, systemic impacts of shocks reverberate across multiple systems. And I'll explain some of what we're seeing in a minute. Um, that therefore resilient policy and investment frameworks and their supporting models should be integrated and coherent. Um, and this is a conversation we've been having, particularly with William and his team, that policy and investments for resilience can focus both, both on a short term and a long term horizon. Um, and we can look at them in terms of resilience by intervention, but also resilience by de design, which I think speaks to the point about the longer term interventions that make, um, make the shorter term uh, interventions um, possible. But these many elements also speak together to more of an evolutionary understanding about resilience. So some of the work that we've done and the research that we've done so far is focused on a multi-systems view. And from this perspective, it's not just about health, economy and environment being separate systems. It's about uh, what I think Lord Sedwell said before that health in this case, you know, this tiny little virus and the policy health policy decisions that have resulted have shocked other systems, economic systems being one of those. Um, and so we're looking at how these interlinkages between these systems give us a new conception and understanding. So for example, you know, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, which has got, <coughs> excuse me, a strong understanding um, of the environmental and, and human health element and of course, this comes from how economic systems in particular and human populations have impacted on the environment over quite a long time. So there's a relationship there that needs to be understood. Um, and with the likelihood that we're going to have further 
outbreaks of zoonotic or other forms of disease, these are important relationships. So it's not just health in isolation, it's health as it relates to other things. Um, within the pandemic experience that health and the economy are inextricably linked. We can't deny anymore that there's a relationship between these because we've seen these interrelationships uh, work from the, the worker level up, you know, and various policy dimensions have impacted on the way firms and workers have been able to work. Disease has impacted on, um, on economic activity and so on, all the way up to the macro level. So a new understanding about health and economy and how these work together. Also too, and this is really interesting, we've touched on this already, but that there are linkages between these systems which speak to resilience. So for example, digital and health. Digital is generally, I used to be a treasury advisor, digital is generally invested as an economic sector, but its impact in terms of new services in health during the pandemic like telemedicine have been really quite profound to the point where I think now we need to consider whether telemedicine is going to be a normal part of a health service system um, and how that works. Genomics, I mean, if we hadn't had genomics and that data sharing at the outset of the, at the pandemic so early on, then how would we have supported drug development, vaccine development across the course of the pandemic. Um, so these, these I see sit at interfaces between health and economy, which I think are really useful um, in terms of understanding resilience from a multi-system view. So this is based on some of our work today. Governance. William, you mentioned governance. Sorry, here it is. I think we can generally say that governance and coordination have really not been optimal. Um, and having worked inside of WHO during the Ebola outbreak, I'd make the same comment that we, we faced the same geopolitical sorts of uh, responses as we, as we have now. So I think the focus has been obviously on the actions of national governments and international coordinations. Uh, and we can't lose the experiences of firms and communities within our economies and our health economies. For example, many communities have been affected by poor health coordination, for example. There's a disconnect between public health and health system, which I think is really important to understand almost as a set of health subsystems um, have not been connected well in many places. Um, and perhaps our global policy is also not connected around those points. On the other hand, there've been partnerships and governance approaches that have emerged, which have been important to understanding a resilient response. So public-private partnerships, for example, I think we've already mentioned, um, existing agreements between governments and academic communities, which I think the UK has obviously got some very good examples. Um, and the emergence of an understanding based on past experiences of outbreaks about new forms of governance in countries, particularly in Asia Pacific, where SARS, you know, less than 20 years ago, have helped to create blueprints and infrastructure which have been important to their resilient response. So for improved resilience, we believe at the moment, or my research is showing that policies, investment, governance, and therefore models and metrics require a reset. Um, and we say reset purposefully. This doesn't mean throwing the baby out with the bath water, but it does mean reviewing. Um, and as Erica said before, reviewing our models and our assumptions that go with those um, in order that they inform policy better. Now here I've adopted our, our OECD um, policy by design, policy by intervention, um, and then framed it with how we might look at investment and governance, but also models and metrics sitting around that. And I think there's several questions that we can ask now based on the pandemic experience. You know, how do we implement resilience by intervention as well as resilience by design or policies focused on those? How do we actually invest? It's not just about more finance, nor more money for something. It's about how and towards what objective? Um, and what have we learned and how can we change it for the better? Um, the models, I think we've already mentioned and we've discussed, but where are the best public investment in models for future resilience? And can separated models, you know, work coherently for better policy design? 
Um, and I think the finally the invitation from the OECD to look beyond growth. Um, how can we contribute to a richer understanding about how the modern economy and the modern health economy works based on the pandemic experience? So that's my slides, William, open for discussion. Great, thanks very much, uh, Annika. A wonderful presentation and you really outlined a very radical <laughs> approach to resilience and uh, the policies, investment and governance that that might require. So, uh, and of course, your colleague, George Freeman has uh, put a link to the, uh, the commission's work on the chat and please feel free to use the chat uh, to uh, start the discussion and ask questions. Our next speaker is um, Igor Linkov, who's a senior scientific technology manager with the US Army Engineer Research and Development Center. And he's also an adjunct professor with Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he's recently been honored with the Arthur S. Fleming Award as an outstanding federal employee for everything he did in response to uh, COVID-19 and how to build in resilience into multiple uh, US agencies. Past recipi recipients of this award include Neil Armstrong, Anthony Fauci, and Robert Gates, among others. So. Uh, He's really done an excellent job and we're so uh, happy to work with him at the OECD and he's contributed so much to us to help generate the tools and practices that our members uh, should be thinking about to really build resilience of systems. So please, Igor. Uh, thank you very much. I just realized I forget to unmute myself. Let me go back to sharing. Um, okay, perfect. Well, it's, an honor, it's really an honor to be invited. And as Willa mentioned, I'm a federal employee, uh, but this presentation doesn't reflect views of uh, federal government. It's only my own views. Um, and uh, what I will try to do, I will try to summarize lessons uh, that we, some of the lessons that we learned from first and second wave in the US. Um, uh, it will kind of uh, lead me to what is systemic resilience really means and how it's differ from risk. Um, and uh, I will uh, try to build on what Annika said uh, on uh, how it can be enhanced through intervention and by design and refocusing uh, from efficiency towards resilience. And hopefully I uh, will have time to discuss what can be done. And I really believe that systemic approaches, including artificial intelligence and modeling, uh, should be on forefront of resilience uh, analytics to drive policy. So my experience with COVID um, actually started uh, last March uh, when uh, New England, uh, which is six states uh, in, in the East, established data analytics section. And I was a lead data analyst. So all uh, decisions that require understanding of the data, uh, kind of um, data manipulation modeling uh, came from analytics done in my team. Um, and I will try to highlight something that is relevant to resilience and uh, maybe something that is not so obvious and you may not see. So uh, here you can see two states, Maine and Massachusetts. Uh, and you can see that Maine was not really affected by first wave uh, and Massachusetts, one of the most severely affected states. But you can see economic impact on Maine was more pronounced than on Massachusetts. This is uh, a, a cards, credit card spending. So uh, it clearly shows that Maine is less resilient than Massachusetts, right? Uh, moreover, uh, we had like some discussions on uh, governance already, and you know here you can see New York. We had the peak, uh, and uh, then uh, we went through phase of lockdown and then gradual reopening. Um, credit card spending followed that very nicely, and you can see that uh, well, when case load is low, people spend more. Uh, when case load is uh, uh, really high, people spend less. But look at California. Um, economically, it was same impact, right? Exactly the same, like 30, some 40% reduction. But what happened is that actually they know they had no cases at this point. Uh, and when caseload in California start to increase, they start to spend more. So you can see that governance not necessarily uh, was implemented in the way that it makes sense from public health and economic uh, system, right? So again, this is just um, you know data. But 
really this is like uh, was shocking uh, uh, headline news from CNN just two days ago, uh, supply chain interruptions. This was the main problem, major problem in the US. And I started studying supply chain resilience some 10 years ago. Uh, and we saw problems uh, in major nuclear accidents and uh, you know uh, Ebola pandemics. But now it's really amazing. In the US, we don't have enough chicken. We have supply chain problem with chicken and ketchup. It's like kind of symbol of, of American you know, food industry. I may understand a little bit like cheap and chlorine issues and metals deficiency, but chicken and ketchup. And uh, the whole food supply chain was one of the amazing stories that uh, is really difficult to believe. So uh, we do have caloric deficiency in New England state, uh, exaggerated by COVID pandemics. Uh, you can see that pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, you, you see increase in caloric deficiency, especially with how, household with children. And um, New England is doing overall better than the US uh, in general, but still you can see quite significant jump over 10% uh, of households reporting caloric deficiency. And if you go to remote location, and tribal location, it's even more amazing. So this is Martha Vineyard. This is where Obamas and Clintons have summer houses. And you would think that they should be okay from food. It's like one of the most expensive real estate. But this is like visiting pantry in Martha Vineyard. You can see significant increase uh, in pandemic uh, time. Why? Because of the supply chain. It's very difficult to bring stuff in, in Ireland and um, supply chain of food supply chain uh, in this area was uh, severely affected and it shows lack of resilience and even basic products. So uh, when we talk about vaccine supply chain, it's uh, the same issue. I try to bring attention to supply chain when uh, Operation Warp Speed just started last May. Uh, and indeed we had a major disruption and we keep having them uh, because of supply chain disruption and vaccine production and distribution. And um, the question is how vaccine manufacturer can persevere given all these unknowns and uh, unknown uh, suppliers and potential problem in the future. So I think um, the last point I'd like to make on what's happening with COVID crisis, and it goes back to this resilience by intervention versus resilience by design. So we like to intervene, but what intervention means for financial uh, and economic side? Well, it's just pumping more money and we try to give loans, uh, in this case for food services. And you can see in New England, uh, the penetration or impact of these loans is really good in areas where they have less need for food, right? While in remote areas, the penetration is really low. So you have this paradox when uh, in areas where you really need to provide more food, uh, these financial investments uh, are not really working. So um, that kind of bring me uh, to all this uh, subject of this discussion, system thinking. Um, we are talking about all this interconnected uh, subsystem that uh, in, in, in case of New England, it's states and industries that affect it. And the question is how to make them more resilient, right? So um, I, I really believe that what uh, COVID pandemic shows is that it's not enough to really deal with risks. Uh, risks uh, are assessed through uh, managing threat and uh, hardening the system so it's less vulnerable. Uh, we really need to move towards resilience, which is ability to recover when something uh, unknown hits you, like pandemic in this case. And um, in our work in uh, New England, uh, we try to really merge together uh, epidemic models with system models and policy models to really provide comprehensive support for policy decision makers. And first issue I'd like to mention is the risk and resilience are different. Um, in risk, we just try to harden the system while in resilience, we try to recover and adapt. Uh, and resilience is one of many properties of system affected by threat. 
again, it's it should not be confused. We often uh, really talk about security and resistance and agility. Um, as a policy makers, uh, we need to be careful uh, about which word we use because for analysts like me, uh, they all have different meanings and we, we need to use different tools to deal with all that. Uh, and uh, resilience, of course, is buzzword of the day. It's ability to recover and uh, adapt, uh, which is like true resilience and ability to withstand and respond. The concept of resilience uh, started to be prominent under Obama administration back in like 12 and 13. Trump administration moved from climate change um, uh, that Obama primarily was looking at uh, to cyber and other areas. And of course, now with Biden, it's uh, across multiple spectrum. Um, and it's not a new field. Uh, in fact, uh, I look at the resilience uh, like Anika in the context of uh, uh, Ebola pandemic uh, like five or six years ago. And we clearly saw the difference between uh, risk and resilience and how it's affected by travel restriction. And what we see is that uh, it's very narrow range that require trade-offs of risk and resilience. And it's need to be analytically established uh, because remember my policy slides when different states implemented different policy and had very difficult, different economic impact. This is exactly the reason. It's very narrow balance that needs to be achieved. Uh, Annika was talking about resilience by design and resilience by intervention already. So this is coming from a paper that we just published. And the idea here is that in economic system, uh, we try to really uh, look at this area. We have investment, we have financial influx in the system with the idea that, you know, it will fix itself. But as I already shown, uh, money uh, cannot uh, buy uh, you everything. You really need to look at the resilience by design when disruption allows system to recover on its own without external intervention. And balance between by design and by intervention needs to be achieved again uh, through uh, quantification of resilience. And another point I like to make is that in economic system, we often look at efficiency. Uh, we like uh, this like simple visuals. Uh, in traffic system, for example, we like uh, to have less traffic all the time. This is what efficiency mean. But resilience means ability to recover from disruptions. And uh, that's something that needs to be built. And even in transportation network, it's different than uh, resilience is different from efficiency. And quantification of resilience is key for doing that. Uh, at NIAC, William and others really work hard on different ways to quantify resilience based on models or based on metrics. I don't think I have time to go through that, but uh, I just like to point out that in some of our work, we really compare resilience and efficiency for different cities. Uh, and we look at economic impact of lack of resilience. You can see here integrated models of uh, uh, resilience in network system and economic model, and you can see uh, lack of resilience translate in significant impact uh, uh, on GDP, even at regional scale for one cities. I will skip the slides. Um, and uh, historically, uh, resilience uh, has uh, been part of how uh, we emerge from uh, previous pandemic. This is in Venice uh, 700 years ago. Uh, in this paper that we published in uh, 2014, we argue that uh, Venetians really implemented resilience by design. Uh, they didn't uh, have uh, financial resources to deal with that, but they, uh, they uh, cut uh, propagation of network of the disease through protective clothes, uh, through quarantine, uh, and through Lazaretta, through Lazaretta Islands and through quarantine when they separate at local level and with quarantine uh, at the regional level, uh, cutting down trade. So that's all uh, changing of the network uh, to slow down the disease. And actually that's what we do now. Um, and um, another paper that we uh, argue back in 2016 that uh, these resilience cycles that 
really collapse uh, society. Uh, Black Death uh, killed two thirds of population in Europe, but then we had the Renaissance, so uh, the system went to a better state. And uh, we were arguing uh, back then that we need to be smart, we need to build resilience in our system, so we are not going through societal collapses. And unfortunately, uh, we have not done as much as we should to really be ready for COVID crisis, but I hope now we will learn lessons uh, and move forward. And I'm glad that OECD and uh, other groups really are focusing on resilience right now. And this was a paper that we published with William um, back one year ago, and it was the first paper that attracts attention to um, moving forward. And the way to do that is to really look at complex interconnections in a system that we have, model them as a system, and use it to guide governance and policy alternatives. And eventually, uh, I really uh, like that we are not uh, uh, repeat mistakes or a less of uh, action that we had from previous crisis. Uh, the problem is that our systems are designed to be efficient. That was with supply chain. The problem that we have with supply chain is that the whole science of supply chain was designed to produce lean, cost-efficient supply chain, but they're not resilient. So in the future, we really need to combine efficiency and resilience to have a both efficient and resilient system. Uh, yeah, and thank you. We published a lot, and this is our new book that is out uh, now on COVID systemic risk and resilience. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Igor. I think when uh, access to tomato ketchup is threatened, it's time to act. But uh, thanks very much for those uh, very practical examples of disruptions to various different supply chains and vaccines, and that it's not enough to deal with just risks, but we need to think about resilience and the ability to recover, in which case, in which case uh, money can't buy everything. Uh, so we really need to think about these trade-offs between resilience and efficiency. But uh, thanks a lot, Igor. Uh, our final speaker today is our co-host, Angus Armstrong, who's Director of Rebuilding Macro. And uh, Angus has expertise in a range of different fields, macroeconomics, financial systems, complexity, constitutional economics, and economic sociology. And as I mentioned in my introduction, he's really pioneered the idea of social macro, which I think is uh, so essential to understanding resilience. So. Angus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, William. And uh, I would like to build on uh, what the previous speakers have been discussing, but perhaps by emphasizing a slightly different uh, dimension, this idea of the social dimension. Now, to one extent, it seems obvious, but then the more you look at it, I would like to suggest that the more that it is absolutely foundational to the idea of resilience. Um, Social is very closely connected to uncertainty, which we all sort of give lip service to, but rarely put it on the table and say, what do we honestly mean? And what are we gonna do about it? Um, just because we say uncertainty doesn't mean to say we have to throw our hands up in the air and say, well, we can't do anything. Uh, uh, we can't forecast things because it's all terribly uncertain. That's not the case. Uh, it's a question of understanding what different types of uncertainty mean and how we can approach these in different ways. So I'll start off by talking about uh, social and then move from social to talk about interdependence and then into uh, uncertainty. So by social, what do we mean? Well, I think if there's one thing that COVID-19 has unambiguously taught us, and I'm aware that people try to read lessons into things, but we interact directly. That's how we catch it. So I think we can all tick that box and say, yes, we do. Now, the trouble is when we interact interact directly, then we can get outcomes that are very different when we interact um, uh, through central systems such as markets. We can get outcomes which display uh, um, different aggregate outcomes to what you'd expect by looking at the micro behavior. So we get into this very interesting area that a number of people have mentioned so far, so far sorry, uh, called complexity. So the first thing is to finally recognize that we have to take on board this interaction. The interactions can be very obvious from just giving each other gifts to much more uh, anonymous interactions, which you know, would seem to be something like ordering through 
things online, but actually our anonymous interactions are really quite social. You know, even Facebook collects 450 different data points on us all. So it's not quite as anonymous as it looks. So we are part of this interactive system. Now, once we sort of accept that we interact a lot and uh, we're part of a social system, the economic outturns have social consequences and social consequences have impacts on the economic systems. And social, uh, the reason why that's most important is because that's really how we have tend to absorb uh, periods of uncertainty. Now, I'll touch on three parts of uh, social macro, but I, I just want to emphasize that it's, it's about interaction and the uh, consilience between economic and social systems, that the economic system is always embedded in the social system. And if anything, there's been an error in the last 30 years of assuming we can look at economic systems quite independently from social systems. When the world is fairly stable, which is an odd thing to say, then perhaps you can do that. In other words, when we're facing small shocks, perhaps it's not a big problem. But when we're facing big events, then it becomes a much greater issue. So the first point is uh, interdependence. Now, uh, it's pretty clear, and a number of people have mentioned that environmental and biosphere interdependence with the social system can't be ignored. Uh, the IPBS has now made it quite clear how uh, uh, crossover uh, pathogens are primarily due to the same sort of economic uh, factors as climate change, such as the intensity of, of agriculture. The implication of this is clearly this is uh, an existential threat. It seems to be increasingly untenable that we ignore this from our economic models and our ways of thinking about uh, uh, social organization. So we have to take interaction seriously. While we're very keen to think about this in terms of environment and biosphere, we also need to think about the social interaction. It wasn't that long ago, back in the 1930s, that economic outturns had very severe social consequences. So these could equally be existential, even though, thank goodness, they haven't been for a long time uh, on most of our continents. So interaction matters and existential risks are not confined to the environment and biosphere. Second, social structures. I was delighted to hear uh, Mark talking about um, inclusive growth. I think it's very important to realize that inclusivity is not a nice to have. Um, before we run up to the global financial crisis or even the pandemic, the world was really struggling with the idea of productivity. How come we've got all these incredible inventions, but there's no productivity? And I suggest that this is because, uh, you know, we have to think very carefully about where productivity comes from. Too often we think it's something exogenous, of course, from outside, which is quite peculiar, really. Um, it really comes from knowledge. And knowledge is something which we grow from interacting with other people. Young people copy other people, we imitate each other. So we have to think about what allows knowledge to grow better within countries. Is it easier when we have uh, countries where they are fairly dislocated and have so-called left behind regions? Or is it easier when we have uh, areas of countries which interact a lot with other parts of the country? What I'm kind of saying there is inclusion may be the thing that leads to growth rather than growth leading to inclusion. In other words, we don't go from trickle down, it actually, the inclusion is the thing that allows us to generate the growth. Uh, while we're uh, in this discussion about uh, international economics, we can also start measuring social outcomes as well. So a paper we're about to be published, which I'm sure uh, Mark has seen before uh, about, um, uh, so Dennis Snower, who is part of our, our network, where we look at uh, agency um, uh, uh, and other dimensions of well-being, environmental and solidarity, as well as just economic. And here it's very interesting because from, since the pandemic struck, we've seen a lot of, uh, in some countries anyway, an increase in internal cohesion, but a very sharp uh, fall in external cohesion. In other words, before the crisis struck, we sort of had Brexit and we sort of had you know, China and US trade wars. Um, the point is that if the world was finding integration more difficult before the pandemic, it looks like looking at the social responses, it has probably become even more difficult. Things like um, vaccine nationalism come to mind. Uh, 
So we have a lot of work to do thinking about how we're going to get some of those undoubted gains that Mark was talking about in terms of uh, international trade. Here again, it's important to make sure the consilience with, between international trade and social system allows to, uh, to do that. The final point goes back to uncertainty. Now, this is where everybody throws their hands up and says, we don't know what to do. Um, I think that we have to be a little bit braver than that. And I'd love to see the word put on the table. Um, there's a number of ways we can try and break this down. So let me just try and give three ways to break this down very quickly. First of all, chance uncertainty. So this is things where we don't know the probabilities, but we kind of know what the possible outcomes might be. Um, this sort of re refers to uh, worlds where they're essentially fairly stable. So we build up buffers uh, in terms of uh, various policy measures and we create institutions. That's how we share the risks between ourselves. So that's uh, chance uncertainty. But then we have uncertainty, which is much bigger, which we can call domain uncertainty, where all of a sudden the world's different to what we thought it was going to be. Uh, and here, it's almost always that the um, resilience comes from the social side, that we rely on people absorbing this in our social systems because we can't plan ahead for it. A very good example of that was in the uh, National Health Service about a year ago when the UK government said they need 200,000 volunteers. This is at the height of the pandemic where, you know, we really didn't know what we were dealing with. And within a week, 750,000 people had volunteered, showing that there is something which is not just homo economicus, where we are actually interested in uh, when we have that sort of domain uncertainty of actually providing support for each other. Now, Things like this mean that the costs can't fall on those who uh, are least able to bear it. And one of the more depressing sites through the COVID crisis has been the way we've talked about average people, where actually we know what kind of people have been mostly uh, subject to COVID and have, have, have very sadly died. That's not only within our own borders, but across borders. So domain uncertainty gets resolved or at least managed by social uh, uh, absorbing it socially, and there we have to think about how we create those right conditions. And the final point is something like ontological uncertainty, where we just find out, my goodness, the world is different to what we thought it was. Now, in the past, we haven't had to deal with this for a long time, but with social media, and uh, we really have to think carefully, we, since the, over the last 60, 70 years, we've tended to equate information and knowledge together. They're not the same information can be completely false, as we now know. And we can see that some people can understand the world as, as functioning in very different ways, which can be very dangerous to our political systems. So thinking about ontological uncertainty and how do we deal with that is also, I think, something which is going to be important if we're to build a resilient system. So I'll stop there and hand back uh, to William. Thank you. Thanks, Angus. And uh, that was a great overview of uh, how the economy is not separate from the social system and the importance of interactions. And uh, at this point in the debate, interaction is very important because we're looking for you to really contribute to the debate and ask some questions. There's various questions already on the chat. Uh, there's one question from Diane on what kind of global governance structures need to be built, not only to effectively incorporate evidence and expertise, but also to see resilience pursued at all levels of governance, not just national or subnational. Um, so that's uh, that's a pretty tough question. But uh, Annika, do you want to maybe have a go at that? I knew you were going to ask me that one. Thank you, and thank you, Diane. I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, someone who's in the audience um, that I was speaking to earlier today actually passed the comment that perhaps we should can compare governance between between what happened at the, during the global financial crisis with what's happened now and what are the strengths of each approach and what are the weaknesses. Um, from a, from a, a health viewpoint, I think um, we've focused a lot on health security and on pandemic preparedness and perhaps we haven't focused um, in the right places, but the, you know that, that some of us have been taken by surprise that some of some very high income countries for example have failed to mount an adequate response at the outset of a pandemic this is quite you know remarkable and um 
so I think from a governor's perspective, it's useful to to look at what the current structures are and and how they can better promote resilience. Um, you know, some of the discussions I know at the moment around vaccines, drug development and, and so on. These are these are genuine governance questions, global governance questions, you know, and the longer we ignore them, the harder they will get. Um, so is that my that's my 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 fudgy answer i'm sorry william i don't have the answer to, to global governance but i think it really does need um some thought okay does anyone else want to come in on that well let me just offer i think um lord sedwell is going to come in uh, uh but let me just offer one thought that global governance i think it's very important to uh think about the level of functional organization. So what is the appropriate level to solve what task? So global, we can, we can only deal with climate change and um, uh, biosystem risks uh, and conflict and so on at an international level, at a global level. So that's the appropriate level for that. Other issues are very much to do with uh, nation states and even regions. And so the question is very much, I think, which policy are we thinking about and then the appropriate governance level depends on um, the, 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 the challenge that we face. Certainly not everything has to be at the international level by a long, long way. I think one of the lessons of the last five years has been people like agency. They want to see their local, their local representatives having a say in their, in their lives as well. Yeah, just briefly, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, in terms of the global institutions, though, uh, I suppose uh, just three quick thoughts. First, um, I'm personally not a fan of trying to invent new multilateral institutions uh, if we can adapt the old ones, because it takes years and you always end up with the lowest common denominator. Um, second, if you really want to build more evidence and expertise into those, those, those multilateral institutions that are responsible for that tier of global governance that Angus and Annika were uh, referring to, then some, thing, some, some quite simple changes, such as um, giving the right of initiative to the director or secretary generals of those institutions themselves or a mandate to um, make recommendations would, um, uh, would be quite important. Some like the WTO, for example, um, the director general doesn't, doesn't actually have a duty to promote global free trade or global free and fair trade or anything of that kind. Um, essentially that rests with the nation states and the initiative rests with the nation states. So some shifts which gave those organizations the way the OECD has the, the right of initiative and some kind of, uh, some kind of mandate um, would, would I think uh, have a small but significant uh, uh, improving effect on global governance. And just on a final point on a, a bit of protocol, um, at least among panelists, uh, it's very nice to be called Lord, stick with Mark, because everyone else, I'm not calling you all professor, so you don't have to call me Lord. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, we have a few questions for, for Erica uh, on the chat. So Erica said that the experts need to talk about what matters most rather than what we can best model. Can you give some examples of this? And uh, do the difficulties of modeling feel, feed into the siloed thinking that many have mentioned between say the health and economic systems, which also Annika talked about. Uh, and then another question, if you can take two at the same time, uh, you also talked about uh, that models are part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Um, so can you or others in the panel say more about what this may mean? So Erica, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, good questions. Um, so on the, the sort of what matters most versus what we can best model, I mean, I think global mean temperature is a great example. And obviously there is a move towards modeling more and more of the sort of more detailed impacts to try to be more relevant and more useful, but with obviously that trade-off of much larger uncertainty. Um, and as I've pointed out in the uh, written answer to that question that the, um, you know, the, the focus on SEIR models for the pandemic, I think, also has sort of especially to begin with when there was kind of only only one sort of model and pictures, you know, these graphs showing flatten the curve and all that sort of thing. Um, 
you know, being able to see kind of that if we do this and we make these assumptions, then that's the impact on the number of people infected, the number of uh, mortalities, etc. Um, and that that sort of creates one kind of response, it creates one kind of intervention, because there's kind of only one thing you can do within the confines of a really simple model like that. And it is uh, reduce the transmission rate. So, you know, there is sort of nothing else you can do. There are no other uh, boundaries within that system. Um, so it sort of steers you into one way of thinking, I guess. Now, uh, I'm not saying that this has happened, but I think there's a tendency for experts in particular to get a bit captured by their models, you know, to, to spend a lot of time in model land and perhaps not enough time in the real world thinking about how it is that the the uh, the kind of big picture insights of model of the models can be transferred to reality, um, and instead perhaps spending a bit too much time on the detail of this specific thing. So I think it does feed into the siloed thinking. I think that uh, you know where two people are using different models, essentially the model is a sort of mediator, a communicator, a way of exploring your assumptions and following them to their logical consequences, and then and then talking about them and communicating them. And if you've got two really different conflicting models, then you are talking at cross purposes there. Um, I'm sure other members of the panel or the audience can think of other examples there. Mm -hmm. And then the second question was um, about experts, uh, how, to, uh, how to ensure that models are part of the solution rather than part of the problem. I think, I mean, really the answer is in uh, acknowledging their limitations, but as somebody else said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, maintaining that insight you know whether it's the the climate models being able to say yes the climate is changing it's changing in these sorts of ways it's going to be a big problem you know there are key headline messages that we can get with extremely high confidence from the models similarly with uh, the seir style um covid models you can get very strong you know extremely good predictions perhaps up to the two week uh, time scale, you can get an extremely good idea of the dynamics of this system and the kinds of ways that things happen. Um, so kind of focusing on, I guess, those uh, large scale insights rather than on detailed quantitative predictions can really help. But I guess what you need there is an expert who is willing to make judgments about those, an expert who is willing to to say my model is wrong in the following way, rather than just saying I've written 3000 papers which run this model with different boundary conditions and here are the outputs. You know, being able to take it and translate it for a, for a policy audience who are acting in the real world rather than in model land. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, Igor, the, there was a comment on the chat that you know, we've seen this before and the resilience concept has been endorsed by governments in the past. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I should like to say a few words uh, to follow Erica's response. Um, so I see two problems with modeling based on my experience. First is that we have many models for components of the system and not too many models at system level and not enough way to fuse the models. Um, and second is that um, in crisis situation, a model should integrate values of decision makers. Um, and this integration of social and physical science is not happening uh, because, you know, as a scientist, I like to produce something that I'm confident in. And, but from a decision maker, they have immediate value scheme that they need to address. And this needs to be developed further. Um, now, back, back to your questions, uh, William. Um, yeah, resilience is not a new word. It was like in English since like, I think 1100s. Uh, and in other languages, it exists. The problem is that in uh, governance uh, world, um, back like some 20 years ago, it was primarily used uh, as uh, synonymous to risk and it still kind of propagates the same. So uh, the problem is not how we call something, but rather what we do. And inability to quantify resilience resulted in lack of uh, governance structures around it. Unlike risk, we can quantify risk and risk science uh, developed tools and methods for doing that some 30 or 40 years ago. So I hope uh, the current crisis will force uh, agencies 
and the commission uh, that we, we started in the UK probably would be a very good, uh, good point to address it. Uh, and I hope that will result in the right use of resilience in governance. Over. Thanks very much, Igor. Uh, could I turn to Matthias Griselli, who's our co co-organizer and uh, perhaps wants to make some remarks, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you, William. Yes, I just wanted to go back to this issue about modeling and, and bring some of the insights we were uh, having in the previous activities that we had at the Fields Institute together with Nike and Rebuild and uh, Macro. Uh, and, and that's the, uh, it's more than just a need to integrate economic models with uh, climate science or with social science, is that there is something fundamentally odd uh, the way that economic models are done uh, currently, and, and it's incompatible with this other uh, uh, domain uh, disciplines. And so I'll give the example with climate change. So uh, the, the, the problem is that even the uh, headline predictions, as Erica was saying, even the headline predictions of economic models don't make sense when integrated with the climate. So you, you cannot have, uh, on the one hand, a climate model that says that, you know, if you're above two degrees uh, increase in temperature, then you are on a, a hot house bifurcation because of the possibility of all the tipping points and nonlinear feedbacks. And on on the other hand, have an economic model that says that uh, two degree limiting the temperature to two degrees is too costly from a uh, trade off between current costs and future damages. And therefore, the optimal thing to do is to have a four degree uh, increase uh, because you put some made up damage function there and discount uh, factor. So, of course, uh, I'm talking about the, the uh, conclusions of the DICE model by Nordhaus. And, and you might think that this is just a silly model. Well, first of all, we got the Nobel Prize, so the economists might. I think that there's something there, but but it's not just that model. It's just it's the fact that, that most of these mainstream economic models uh, will continue to be based, even if they depart from dice on uh, representative agents, which are very different than taking averages in agents. It's just assuming there is one agent, so no social interactions, as Angus was saying, uh, and rational expectations and instantaneously adjusting variables. Whereas with the climate and, and social sciences, that's not, not how it's done at all. So I think that there's a sort of methodological incompatibility between this that needs to be addressed so you can have the type of coherent resilience that uh, Anike was talking about. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Matthias. So uh, we're almost at time, but I just wanted to give all our speakers one, if they wanted to make one additional point to close things out, maybe we will start in, with uh, Erica. Oh, don't start with me. I haven't thought of anything yet. <laughs> um, well, we can we can go to Annika if you if you prefer. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Was that because I laughed? Thank you, William. Um, I think uh, we've touched on so much today, but I'm not sure we've solved the problems of the world. Um, I would say that the way forward is is definitely from a models perspective, it's interdisciplinary, isn't it? And um, and truly interdisciplinary. Um, I think someone mentioned the word trade off before, and I think that's a concept we need to reconsider um, from a personal personal viewpoint but having worked in treasury for a long time I understand you know that that's how decisions actually do get made but you know do we need to reconsider how those business cases those investment cases come in that can that, that use those types of models yes I think we do um, so such a lot of rich rich content for me particularly so I just want to thank everybody and great questions hard questions yay more of those Okay, great. Igor, if you're still with us. Um, yes, uh, no, I, it was really great panel and I do believe it's a great start um, moving in the right direction and looking forward to the commission report and I'm glad Nike and OECD are really moving in this direction. Over. Thanks, Igor. And Erica, are you? Yes, sure. Um... I guess I wanted to come back to the sort of the role of values here that it's it's easy to get bogged down in sort of decision making based on science and maybe something that's come out quite clearly here is the need for more of a discussion of values. Something that I was kind of thinking as Igor was talking about resilience was maybe the need for more of a definition of uh, what it is that we want to be resilient, you know, how do our values influence that and perhaps that also ties in with the question about um, 
you know, global governance and uh, different coordinating institutional structures. In order to have a framework for that, you have to have a sort of shared values or a shared vision of the th what it is that you want to be resilient, not just what it is that you want to be resilient to, mm. but what it is that you want to be bouncing back afterwards. You know, do we want the uh, global fossil fuel industry to be resilient or not? Uh, do we want, you know, we, we have to think about what it is that we want to be uh, generating as positive outcomes and, and take that discussion maybe as high level as possible. Um, so yeah, I guess that was what was coming out for me was really the, the, um, that the models and experts are contributing to this debate and that perhaps we're a bit one-sided at the moment and we should be looking for more of that discussion. Thank Thanks. you for having me. Thanks, Erica. Uh, Mark, a final word from you? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, fascinating uh, panel to have participated in. Thank you for including me. Uh, I really just wanted to reinforce Annika's point about um, the intersection here. I think you can see that just in risk. So if we think about uh, the, the, the uh, potential uh, tail risk within climate change, um, as Erica was saying, the two degrees will essentially average, if we're lucky, will conceal an awful lot of variation, in particular uh, for low-lying areas, uh, floodplains and so on, in terms of the impact. And then you look at that and combine that with, for example, uh, demographics um, and understanding land use, and so on, and it's it's going to be the, the reality for policymakers and governments is going to be it's going to be the intersection of those risks. You have an aging population, poor poorly drained um, uh, uh, floodplains, and climate change, and that's going to be the thing that could have a catastrophic uh, effect on the welfare of of at least segments of your population, if not um, at a uh, at a global level. And of course, all politics is local. So finding a way to bring some of these disciplines together, finding some common language, even if we can't um, expect our modelers to uh, produce something that is that is you know, completely all singing or dancing, although with modern statistical techniques, AI and so on, there may well be some opportunities uh, there, but just finding a common language and enabling them to have that conversation, understand some of those issues and flag uh, where some of the hotspots might be, I think would be a very powerful aid to governments and policymakers. Great. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for your leadership on these issues. And I think we're really making progress on, on the issues that you identified. Angus. Well, I, I as a co-host, I would just like to uh, extend my thanks to Mark and to all of the other panelists um, and to you, William, for uh, hosting this meeting. So um, I'm not going to give any final remarks. I think that Mark has uh, positioned them absolutely perfectly. So I just pass back to you. Okay, uh, well, thanks Angus and thanks to you and, and your team, uh, Richard Arnold and Carla Kohlberger for expertly managing this uh, event. I think what the discussion really shows us is that we really do need to think about our systems, uh, the mandates, the governance, the values. We need to think about our economics, the methods, models, uh, the social context in which we think about economics, uncertainties. And we need to think about resilience in, in very different broad ways beyond just thinking about risks. But the good news is there's a, a lot of things that are going on, the G7, the Resilience Commission, the work of rebuilding macro uh, and Nike. And uh, all of these are, I think, preparing us better for the future and to deal with the uh, shocks ahead. So I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion. <laughs>